This is what you're going to see. Okay, it's just returning it backspace, right? Uh, I think I'm okay with that. And then here's your, yeah, okay. you just make sure when you're doing the pointer, it's up in the screen so okay. it shows on these screens. So have you gone live yet? Yeah. You want to check the audio? Got one minute. Less than one minute. Okay, sounds good. All righty. Okay, it's 7.30, and we're going to get started. Welcome to the April meeting of the Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society. I'm Doug Holland, and this is a nice picture that was contributed by Andrew Olson of the Eclipse up here. This is our agenda for this evening. Um, oh, Trevor, are you going to be able to field questions or not? No, okay. So I won't even bring that up. Okay, so this is your first time here tonight. We want you to raise your hand, tell us your name and uh, how you found out about us and what your interest is in astronomy. Are you two willing to admit yeah. that you're new? <laughs> I've been here, but this isn't my first talk. Does that count since it's been like eight years? Yeah. <laughs> so who are you? What are you doing here? My name is Kirsten Deal. Um, I have grown up down here since I was real little. Um, grown up with the NASA community. She actually taught Ask former astronauts how to swim when they were little kids. Their kids. Yeah. Oh, their kids. But either way, I was I grew up with the astronaut community in this area. Um but that's about it. But I've always been astronomy. And Excellent. I have to give you clips. And this is your friend. I'm her aunt. <laughs> her aunt. Yes. I'm a retired teacher and uh, uh, got to work at in mission control my senior year in high school as a gopher. Wow. That's what we all did there. Okay, anybody else? First time here. I know you're new. Yeah. I'm Megan Dorf, and I don't remember. That's a good question. Okay, uh, how did you find out about us? On Nita. Really? Mm -hmm. That's the third time I've heard that. And what's your what's your interest in astronomy? Um, whenever I was looking for things to do on Nita, it was a free activity that was fun. Well, we are definitely free. <laughs> All right. Anybody else first time here? Right here. Hi, I'm David Dale. I've been trying to be an astronomer, astronomer for 20 years. And <laughs> seems like every time I live in a nice high dry area, I didn't have telescopes. I didn't have time to use them. And I had plenty of time to use them when I was at low elevations and high humidity. Excellent. Anybody else first time here? I don't think so. I think I know everybody else. All righty. Okay, so if you guys would like to get our email distribution, uh, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can write those down. The first one is just for meetings only, and the bottom one is for all of our general uh, yeah, distribution. And Al is holding up a, uh, a clipboard. If you don't want to do that, you can go get one of these little tear-off things that has those same two email addresses. To shoot them an email and shoot one to Ron at the top and say, I want to get on yours for meetings only. I'll get one, shoot one to David, and that'll get you on David's for the general distribution. That is our emails. Uh, speakers, please use this little red mouse thing here so that people online can uh, see what you're pointing at. Now, first up, we have David Havlin, who's going to tell us about going to Mazatlan. Mazatlan. All right, let's hear for David. Uh, the microphone is in the computer. Got it. So don't go too far away. Oh, that's something else. The speaker, don't go too far away from the computer because that's where the microphone is. Gotcha. All right. Slide up a little bit. 
Connie and I literally just got back as of Wednesday from a trip to Mazatlan. Um, we're holding up for Paul Maley, the Texas flag, as he likes to have the Texas flag represented at any event that he's involved with. That is a picture of our rig. We'll discuss that a little bit, little bit later on. This, out of curiosity, of course, is a picture of the United States. That red streak is the availability, not available, of bed and breakfasts across the center line of the United States. Thought you might enjoy that. This one is fun. I think we all probably saw this ahead of time. This is the historical cloud uh, percent cloud fraction historically for April 8th across the entire uh, line of totality. That's why Paul chose Mazatlan and actually a small cruise ship off in the, off in the Gulf that, was a, that he had steered into the line of totality. Texas was supposed to be really nifty, low 40%, 50%. If you were up in the New England, Quebec area, you're supposed to be banjacked. Well, obviously, as we know, that is not what happened. Uh, Texas, part of Texas, I think Dallas and Waco ended up okay. I know down here in Houston, my tech, tech uh, texted me saying, no, it's thundering and raining at Method Methodist right now. Yet my daughter and a friend, up in, a cousin and a family relation up in uh, upstate New York were able to watch it from their patio. So it the, the weather just turned this upside down. Now, total truth, in Mazatlan, we were supposed to be completely clouded out, and basically we're, some of us were looking forward to four days of fun. But the weather kept improving until actually literally that morning. It just kept getting better and better. We ended up having a high-level layer of clouds that uh, uh, came through, and then coming through the high-level high level layer of clouds, the clouds almost act like a film screen, and it worked out very, very well for us. These are the resorts. The sun basically came over here building three on this kind of a pathway straight up. Once we're out on the pool deck, it was uh, wide open. Eclipse Tours, as we know, is headed by Paul Maley, who's a long-running member of this club, used to work here at JSC. Uh, we had over 240 attendees led by myself, Connie, Tamara, and Fred Letty. She came from MIT. Uh, Ted and Peggy Blank, that came out of Arizona. Ted's a big occultation specialist, as is Richard Nugent. Richard Nugent was also a member of this club, HAS, but he now lives out in Austin. <coughs> Construction of this uh, resort literally opened, what was it, uh, April 2nd. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those, we're, we're booking to go someplace 10 months ago that one of the foundations of the building hadn't even been poured yet. So that's where this was. And when the hotel realized what was going on, they said, oh, you don't need to bring 120. You need to bring 240 people. So they, they, they said we had to do that. They ended up running construction 24-7 and, and three eight-hour shifts for the last three months. The place was just impeccable. It's, all, it's, it's driven by Hyatt. But it was only ready for about 60% capacity. It was cool. We had little construction things. Connie and I had to, oh, yeah turn on the uh, water underneath the left-hand sink in the bathroom because they'd left that open. Every electronic device you get, how come this stupid thermometer isn't working? Oh, the plastic screen. Take it off, though, take it off the thermostat on the wall. So little, little things like that you kind of had to look, uh, look out for. Sunday and Monday, we camped out on the far north end side. I know I'm not giving you really a perspective from the top down, but this is our setup on, on the day of the... Uh, day of the eclipse. In 2017, this is what I used for, for, for that. I used the Orion wide tube attached to my Canon with a solar filter and this poor Velbron mount that I almost all but destroyed in uh, 2017. Surprisingly, it's still with me, but it's kind of showing its age because it's really not suited for this kind of weight. So I figured I needed to upgrade. The only thing I really took with me and we kept going was, was this. So I upgraded to this. Connie's six, T6i, Canon 6Ti, that has a nice little screen that helped with focus. Uh, as an um, anniversary present to each other, we picked up this beast. Uh, weighs about four and a half pounds. Underneath this, um, uh, uh, not a dew shield, but a light shield, is that uh, solar filter. We put it on a Manfrotto gearhead that has a 12-pound capacity, and it was absolutely rock steady. A sixteenth of a turn, and it would just move beautifully. And that was on top of a uh, carbon fiber Manfrotto mount. The advantage with this particular camera was the nice screen off to the side so I could actually use the two sunspots, if some of you saw it, the two sunspots and the edge as a means of focus. Did complete manual focus. 
I did total exposure control on her, this camera, Connie's camera allowed me to actually shift so I could do an on-spot exposure, <laughs> one slightly under and another slightly under to try to bring out any detail in the, in the corona. So I had a timer set up to get uh, pictures at five minutes and to take three pictures at five minute intervals. And this is C1, or not C1, but this is well into the eclipse. Here are the two, uh, two sunspots. A group in back of us had taken a hole punch and punched out Mazatlan 2024. And you can actually, if you look hard enough, you can actually see the little crescents, crescents in there. Uh, the mate, so just after, um, Missed the Bailey's bees, but this is just right at the beginning. And then this is right smack in the middle of totality. And yes, these are uh, solar flares popping up that popped up really nicely. I dial in on it here with a signet ring that starts coming out. Somebody, I believe, on FBAC, or I don't know if it was HAS, did a little thing where they came across from this distance to this distance and the number of pixels and figured out got the diameter of the sun and figured out how many pixels was, you know, how many miles there were in a pixel and then determined that this solar prominence with a big hole in it was probably about 32,000 miles high. A few Earths would fit underneath it. It was pretty, it was pretty, it was pretty awesome. Toward the end, on the backside after, but after C3 heading into C4, hadn't quite seen the uh, 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 sunspots come up yet. But one of the things that we really wanted to try at the behest of, uh, behest of Paul Maley were some temperature data loggers. Connie and I used these to uh, ascertain the health of RV refri <laughs> recreational vehicle refrigerators. So here's the temperature data from the um, uh, shade. We had one in the shade, one in the sun. And effectively, effectively, somewhere in here, it's off an hour. I apologize for that because obviously it started at 1032, but no, 1032 was well into the eclipse. It was really started more at uh, 9.30. For us, 9.51 was when C1 took, took place. So over here, it would probably be C1, C2, C3, right there, right there at the bottom, and then up here around C4. And obviously, since it's later in the day, that's why these temperatures are higher than they are over, higher, higher than they are over on the left-hand side. Um, it got perceptively cooler. There are people all of a sudden grabbing beach towels and starting to use that as uh, additional means of trying to keep warm. The uh, this is I said this is in the shade. And it's a lot more steady. This one was on the ground in the sun. It's a little bit more has a little bit more variability, but that's part of the reason that uh, uh, Paul and I wanted to compare it. So again, coming up here, down here is totality. Coming up here was a uh, uh, C4. We started the temperature loggers 20 minutes before C1 and turned them off about 15 to 20 minutes after. And it wouldn't be complete if I didn't do my own little collage of them. So uh, C1, just barely a nip out here all the way through C4 sitting here. And then here are two sunspots. So I'm still kind of working on some of these figures because I've got like 284 of them now since I took them at five minute intervals at three shots each. But that's where I that, that's that's where we were. That's where we had our fun. So thank you very much. OK. Uh, Reed is not here, right? Reed. OK. Reed called me. He was having car trouble. So that's. Understandable. Uh, Reed was going to tell us about the Sea Star S50 uh, telescope, and um, Ken Lester also had a members' minute about the Sea uh, Star S50 telescope. So Ken did a um, a uh, time lapse video of the solar eclipse from um, Junction, Texas. He did one second, per, one frame per second. Uh, cloud cover is moderate, and they also had a lot of wind. So you're going to see that in this video that Ken made. So this is from Ken Lester in uh, in Junction. Yeah. Did we ever kill the lights? Yes. This is it.
not doing it again. That's the point. Okay, so that's from Ken Lester. We thank him for that, even though he's a long way from here. He's a member of the club for a long time, longer than I've been here. Okay, Stan, is Stan here tonight? There's Stan! Okay, Stan's going to tell us everything about using the ZWO ASI Air Plus. <laughs> And actually, we heard. I heard from some other people who are interested in hearing this talk. Here, they're here tonight. Okay. Yeah. Who was that that was telling me they want to know more about the ASI Air? There's somebody. Oh, those two right there. Those, yeah. yeah, you can direct your presentation. Those two. Okay. Evening. Can you all hear me? Okay. All right. Okay, this is my little setup that I have uh, <clears throat> AM5 mount on a tripod. It's uh, running off battery power, and I've got this uh, William Optics Red Cat, and I have a huge finder on here at that time. It's, it's bigger than the <laughs> main telescope. Anyway... <clears throat> Uh, first, you set up your telescope's polar axis approximately aligned with the uh, North Celestial Pole and uh, start everything up, start the mount up, and uh, the ASI Air Plus uh, computer, which is out of sight on the back side of that black finder or auto guiding scope. Um, got to excuse me for a moment. I uh, wrote this a month ago and I'm trying to remember everything. Anyway, I've got uh, the Wi-Fi controller for polar alignment, plate solving, auto guiding. It's got a, a ASI 120mm mini uh, <clears throat> auto guiding uh, camera. Uh, it's got the go-to mount control. It's got a main camera control. I'm actually using an ASI 585MC. It's a one-shot color, non-cooled. I understand they've got a cooled version out now. Uh, it's actually a planetary camera, but it works just fine on dark uh, sky objects. Uh, the uh, computer also controls the uh, autofocus through the ZWEAF, and it's got dew heater power. It's got four outlets, uh, outputs for um, power for control or dew heaters. And I'm using a Zachary Jackery uh, Explorer 300 portable power station, 293 watt hours. It's got USB, both types of USB connectors. It's got uh, DC and AC outputs. I actually use an AC output uh, for my mount and camera drive. I use a, a AC-DC converter that I plug into the AC output. Uh, <clears throat> of course, all of the components are connected to the ASI Air Plus. It's got like five, uh, four USB connections and one power connection. But uh, it's uh, connected directly to the AM5 mount, and then I jumper from it to the ASI Air Plus, and then through the USB connections, everything else is powered up. And uh, I control it through either an iPad or an iPhone with the, with the app. Okay, uh, hopefully you can read that. Okay, uh, when you first start the app, uh, this screen, well, a couple of screens before this pop up, but you just keep hitting enter. And then this is kind of the main uh, setup panel. Uh, it's got your latitude and longitude already uh, entered through GPS. And uh, it's got, it shows your, uh, appear your mount. You can change that to other types of mounts. It's not just the ZWO. I know 
there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> complaints about this ASI Air Plus that it only works with ZWO equipment, which is mostly true, but at least in the area of mounts, that it will uh, run multiple different uh, manufacturers' mounts. Uh, you also can set up your uh, <clears throat> mini and guide scopes focal lengths. As you can tell, my red cat is 250, 249 in this case, and the finder mm -hmm. or auto guiding scope was 240. Uh, the main camera, it uh, that's the nice thing about this uh, setup is it reaches out and talks to all the pieces of equipment and sets them up automatically. It's very seamless. Uh, the only thing that you have to work on is if you're using a mount that's not a ZWO manufactured mount, but everything else is automatically set up. I did not have a filter wheel, so it's uh, not lit up. Uh, but the uh, automatic or the uh, elect electronic autofocuser is connected. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, from that page, you hit the enter button at the lower right corner. I don't know if I pointed that out down here. You hit the enter button. And uh, this, this panel pops up, which is your preview. Preview is right here. Okay. Most of the functions of the ASI or Plus can be operated from this single page. <laughs> Uh, you tap each of the icons across the top of the page to confirm all your equipment is powered up. As I stated, there's no focus wheel, so everything else is already powered up. Um, verify that sometimes uh, I have had to reset things and some of this equipment doesn't uh, reconnect, but it's easily uh, go to the icon and set it up again. Just basically turn it on. Okay, on the right side, uh, the set controls on the right side of the page to preview and set your, I typically set the initial exposure to 10 seconds because I'm usually trying to find uh, Polaris, make sure Polaris is in the field of view. Uh, otherwise, it, it's very difficult to make it uh, uh, set up the uh, polar alignment. But I'll take a 10 second photo and just check it out. And if it's, if it's there, uh, I move on to the next thing. Okay, also at this point when I take that first initial photo, if the images don't appear to be focused, you can go to the left side of the page. Down here there's a little button here for autofocus, or you can manually focus with these up and down arrows. It's got a slow function and a fast function, but uh, if, if you're fairly well focused, you can go to the autofocus uh, button, and that will start the autofocus. Uh, I'm sure everybody's pretty familiar with these uh, curves, uh, these these uh, little dots along the curve or the uh, <clears throat> it, uh, the camera, main camera takes images of a star that it finds uh, in the field of view and uh, changes the, uh, through the autofocus or motor, it turns your focusing wheel and adjusts the focus and it uh, plots these uh, points along the cur curve uh, versus your position on your uh, focusing motor and the diameter of the image of the star. Uh, once it finishes its routine, uh, it will set the focus that uh, brighter dot at the very bottom of the curve. Uh, <clears throat> that is your best focus that it can uh, attain. And uh, in this particular case, the star image was 2.92 pixels. So then I go to polar alignment. Uh, let me get back to this screen here. This, this preview, you can tap on that and it gives you a whole menu of other functions. One is polar alignment. So uh, I skipped that step. But the left, uh, on the left uh, image, tapping on the arrow button on the right side of the page starts the polar alignment routine, which includes plate solving in the North Celestial Pole region. The right image, uh, Shows the plate solving takes a matter of seconds and then tapping on the next button right here, if you can see that. I can barely see it in my view here. Um, rotates the telescope about 60 degrees counterclockwise, viewed from the south. Stan, I got a question for you. Sure. Do you use the imaging camera for that? Yes, the main camera. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, 
In the left view, after 10-15 um, seconds, it takes another image of the rotated view of the North Celestial Pole region and performs the plate solving and it compares the original image to the rotated image and it starts telling you uh, once you hit the let's go button here uh, it pulls up this little target here and north celestial pole is the dot in the center that little circle to the right of the medium circle is approximate where the telescope polar axis is pointing uh, so it uh, also tells you through these instructions up here, uh, altitude, in this case, I needed to lower the polar axis to get it to line up better with the polar axis elevation or altitude. And also there are uh, azimuth instructions on which direction to adjust the telescope base <laughs> so that you're getting uh, aligned with the uh, polar axis. And sometimes it can take a while, and sometimes it's, uh, it's just a couple of minutes. But uh, in this left view, this is the base of the AM5 uh, telescope mount. And this little lever here is your altitude adjustment. And this knob and this knob control your side-to-side uh, -side azimuth. So... Um, it, I found it best to uh, click on this button right here, which is auto. And what it does is it just repeats taking images until you get your uh, North Celestial Pole lined up. Uh, within five minutes, uh, I'm kind of a perfectionist at times. I try to get within a minute uh, in uh, latitude and azimuth. Uh, just feel like it maybe does a little better on the tracking. And your azimuth on that mountain, does it have a lock-down screw once you get it set? Yeah, they're hard to see. There's a there's a lever here, okay. like a little L lever on each side. Right. Okay. And the altitude adjustment, there's a, like a big wing nut on both sides. Right. And I've found that if you tighten those down pretty tight, it screws up your right. That's alignment. That's good. So I, what I do is I just slightly turn them down real slow, and then I double-check it. And, right. Right. Uh, but if you're if you're not uh, aggressive with it, it doesn't adjust. It doesn't make it that bad. That's why you can stay within that five minutes. Pretty easy. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so go back once it's uh, aligned, and you hit the finish button. You get fireworks and all this BS. But. Uh, <laughs> You get a little fireworks display and congratulations. And it also times you relative to all the users out there, hundreds of thousands of users worldwide. I'm never near the top. But uh, anyway, it's for fun. Okay, on the left side, I've gone back to my preview and I've taken another 10 second mm -hmm. picture uh, just to see how well uh, the field looks and if everything's still in focus. Um, if everything's good there, then I can go to, uh, there's a magnifier icon. It's hard to see in my view, but right here, there's a little magnifier, uh, like a magnifying glass. You click on that, and it gives you this drop-down menu of uh, tonight, tonight's best targets, and there's thousands of them. This is just a small uh, example of it. It basically starts with the moon and the planets and uh, you know, on this particular night, uh, 12P Ponds Brooks was uh, uh, fairly well up in the sky, so it was one of the targets for the evening. But it, it gives you a little uh, thumbnail picture of the target, of uh, the item that you can select. Uh, but uh, And you can scan up and down the page, and what you do is you click on the field here, uh, which gives you basically the location of the object at that time. That dot right there gives you the elevation above the horizon and also in some cases uh, that like this vertical line here is when that object is at the what is it it's not the terminator meridian, meridian. meridian. yeah sorry um, <clears throat> that gives you an idea of how to plan the access to the target and following the target you know if you've got to set up your meridian flip things like that 
but it's uh, it's very very nice to have that drop down menu and it's there's thousands of objects. There's objects in there that are like 25th magnitude. You would never go looking for those things with that with a 50 millimeter telescope. But anyway, you can pick an object, and in this case, I picked Andromeda Galaxy uh, on this particular night for the example. And this go to icon here lights up. You click on that, and your telescope uh, pans to that object. And uh, it may take a few seconds, but it's what it's doing is it's it knows approximately where the object is and it takes pictures and then does a plate solving. And based on, I guess, its database, it tunes you right in exactly. It might take once or twice. It'll, it'll move the telescope every time while it's getting closer and closer to the object. And eventually it gets right on target. And uh, this down here says it usually confirms in like two seconds and then it times out and the item actually they take a, it takes a picture of the item three or four second picture um, and uh, it's visible uh, this upper left image here let me go back to this okay down here there's a little constellation of the uh, big dipper and you click on that and that gives you this kind of picture so that you can frame your camera on the object. That's, that's what the object looks like in relation to the uh, latitude and longitude of lines of the sky. It's, it's, in, it's incredible. I love it. Uh, but you can also rotate your camera, take another image, and then go back to this, and it has changed your camera. Uh, so obviously I had rotated this one around to where it fits really nicely with Andromeda Galaxy. So uh, then I go back using this back arrow here. I go back to the preview screen and take a picture. And I can't remember. I can't see what the exposure time was. That's 30 seconds. And this is from my driveway, Border Lake, Friendswood. Wonderful sky there. But that's a 30-second image. Here's M110, M31, of course. And uh, I think this is M32, maybe. Is that correct? Okay, so then you can, uh, once you've got your target acquired, you can go into the auto guiding. And uh, auto guiding is this, uh, this little panel up here. If you click on that, the other, this other box opens up. Uh, and it's PhD too. Uh, all the files are, uh, are listed as PhD when you look at your files. Okay, so once you open that up, it starts the PhD2 routine, uh, does multi star auto guiding, and after the initial star acquisition is set up and calibration, the auto guiding, auto -guiding starts. Uh, you can change your aggressiveness here to adjust, and, and you can watch your right ascension and declination uh, tracking accuracy. It's in uh, seconds of arc, and uh, then it gives you your total RMS. And uh, some nights it works really good when it's not real windy or something like that. Then uh, you don't have to be as aggressive. But it, it I've found that uh, on really good nights, I can get down to a third to a half arc second tracking. Um, one thing I should tell you, though, is right before I left for the Texas Star Party, I was using the, the same setup one evening. And the first time I turned it on that evening, uh, ZWO forced an upgrade. You can't skip it. It forces you to take the upgrade. And now it's tracking at two arc seconds. So I've got a beef with ZWO on that. So I'm, oh, they, two arc seconds? Two arc seconds oh, of tracking now. But before that, I could, I would, I was getting sometimes a quarter of an arc second. But most of the time, on the average, 0. 0.5, 0. 0.65. Yeah. So they've done something in that new uh, upgrade. So once it starts tracking, you can hit this little minimization button here, and it goes back to this up here so that you can monitor it, but it clears up the screen so you can take pictures. Uh, okay. 
In the main interface page, I usually take a series of exposures of various durations while watching the histogram at the bottom of the page down here. Uh, sorry, different night, different object. <laughs> I changed objects, but that's M42 uh, <clears throat> to continue the presentation and the slides and everything. I had to use the new photos. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Okay. At that time, if you're happy with your focus and your tracking and your centering of your object, the framing of the object, uh, you can go into the auto run, which sets up all your exposures that you're going to take. You can take hours of exposures. You set up your exposure durations and things like that. But uh, again, uh, over here, you've got the preview button. If you hit it again, it drops down this little menu here. It's got a focus panel. It's got a polar alignment, uh, live stacking, and it's also got preview and auto run. Auto run is when you want to set up all your exposures for a night of uh, picture taking. So click on that, and uh, there's a little, I forgot to mention, there's a little hamburger stack here. You click on that, and it opens this uh, box where you can edit your sequences. Uh, one thing I haven't talked about is uh, uh, I was only taking light exposures. You can do your bias, flat, and darks with this same uh, little panel. So that's that's come in real handy, too. It automatically sets all of your exposures uh, for your upcoming uh, photo session. But... Uh, One thing here that's kind of uh, confusing, it says exposures, and you know, I, I feel like that's the number of exposures, but it's actually your exposure length, and it's got a little drop-down menu here. It gives you different uh, starts at it, like 15, 30, 60, 120, 180. Uh, also, you can hit this button and type in any length you want. Uh, for my location, dark sky objects, I've found uh, that 180 seconds is about as much as I could go because of the pollution, the light pollution. Uh, sometimes I'll use a uh, dual narrowband filter for uh, objects with a lot of hydrogen alpha light uh, reflection and output. But uh, most of the time with the uh, Red Cat, I don't use a filter. Uh, I've tried uh, the... Uh, Nebula filters, uh, high contrast, uh, but it's, it just hasn't done very well with the photographs. Okay, uh, gain, uh, global gain, that, that means you're using the gain that you have set up in the camera already. If not, you can change that to any other gain you want. It'll override what you have in the camera. And then the repeat is the number of photographs you're going to take. In this case, it's 20 frames of 180 second, seconds each. And you can change the bin uh, if you want, but I have not experimented with that. I usually use bin one. So once that's done, I uh, have that all set up. I click OK. And uh, it'll start your exposures. And I was real lucky within about, uh, I think, five or six exposures, I had to have a meridian flip, which I didn't talk about. Uh, it's kind of hard to see here, but there's a uh, one of these little slider buttons. You can set up Meridian Flip, turn it on, off and on. Uh, but you have to go to another screen to actually set up the Meridian Flip, when it occurs and all that. How many minutes before the Meridian, you stop shooting. And it flips the camera and uh, or this telescope and camera and then waits another period of time. But I'm sure most of you are fully versed on the Meridian Flips on these uh, telescopes. So, uh, it does another, once it flips and reacquires the target, it also does another uh, plate solving and verifies it's confirmed that it's exactly on the target. And in some cases, if you have it set up, it'll do another autofocus, which is handy if it's you know halfway through your photographs, if it's a, an hour, and the temperatures are changing, you, you might want that. Sometimes I forget to turn it off when I don't want it, and it wastes some time. Anyway, uh, 
So it continues and takes, uh, there's a counter up here. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, it's like number six out of 20 or something at that point. But uh, continues taking photographs and uh, until you get uh, all 20 pictures taken or however many you set it for. But occasionally uh, I'm watching these photographs come up and every once in a while something interesting comes into your into your screen frame. Uh, I don't know if you can tell right here, there's a meteor. And uh, this is a zoomed up view. Here's your running man. And there's the meteor. <laughs> now, when, uh, when you're using the processing software, uh, those kind of items, if it looks out of place, it doesn't save that particular object. And Elon Musk has a lot of uh, satellites crossing my images. Okay, once uh, eventually all exposures are completed and the process stops, images are saved internally. That ASIR Plus has internal memory card. It also has a slot for an <coughs> external memory card if you need more memory. And, uh, but I mean, I. You can take pictures all that long and it won't fill up the uh, onboard memory. Don't ask me to quote the amount of memory it's got. Images can then be downloaded from the ASI Air Plus via cable or from the mini memory card, micro memory card, I meant to say, uh, and saved onto your laptop for further stacking and processing using your choice of programs. Okay. That's it. Any questions? Or did I put everybody to sleep? <laughs> uh, yes. Your battery. Your, what, how long did that last? Uh, with the AM5 and all the cameras that I have, and I go, I look at several different targets and take photographs. Sometimes all night long on the weekends. Uh, it. At the end of the day, it's around 40% capacity still left in it. And I've got a, a larger CGXL, Celestron CGXL mount and multiple cameras on it, and it's about the same. So I have two of the batteries now, one for star parties. Any other questions for Stan? Okay. Thank you. What's the biggest oh. issue you run into with um, just you having issues you have with it that you find, you could say, or? Well, until they uh, updated the software uh, a week ago, I was having great uh, tracking accuracy. Now it's terrible. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be going to the ZWO website. There's a website where all the users are always asking questions. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's got this problem. But uh, what's that? No. And uh, the other thing, as I mentioned, is when I started up the uh, ASIR Plus a, a little over a week ago, it went into automatic up, upgrade. It didn't give you the choice. It just, if you want to use it, you're going to take this upgrade. And it, it upgraded. So something either happened in the upgrade process or uh, they've got a bug. But other than that, everything works seamlessly. You turn it on, power it up, turn everything on. As long as all of your cables are plugged into the computer, everything, it reads all the devices, sets them up, and you're ready to go. Any other questions for Stan? Yeah, thanks. Right, thank you. Okay, and that's Andrew, whose picture we were looking at on the first slide, but he was late and did not get to see his picture. But you used your picture on the very first slide. So he's hiding behind, uh, yeah, we know you're there. <laughs> okay, next up, we have Mark. He's going to tell us about UV astronomy on the moon. Hey there. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so I don't have any eclipse pictures. Sorry. Um, but David, yours, yours were excellent. And... Uh, that video from that was, cool. that was a cool video. Cool. So glad, glad they had that. Um, so I'm going to talk about UV astronomy from the moon. Um, this is uh, some of you all know that Susan and I we um, we do a lot of volunteer work at Space Center Houston, um, and actually our club is pretty well represented because 
Justin is in the he's in the education department. Um, Dan is a volunteer, and he, you actually led a lot of the um, the eclipse stuff that happened um, this past this past weekend. So um, yeah, so we're still, we we have a good presence there. Um, I have the privilege of being able to be around a lot of artifacts from there, and um, and actually have done some uh, some research on a number of them to to for uh, per, for myself but also for the for the center um, and so when I came across um, this I decided this is a good good topic because it relates to space um, and also uh, to astronomy so um, so that's that's what we got and this is from Apollo 16 1972 so 50. Almost 52, well, close to 52 years ago now. Um, so, he, yeah, here's what we're going to talk about. So um, I just want to do a quick thing reminding about the electromagnetic spectrum so you understand why the, the, this UV thing happened. Uh, some details about this, the, the Apollo 16 camera. And then uh, just a sampling of, um, of some of the data and learnings that they had. Uh, there's going to be words on the page. You don't have to read them. I put them there mostly so if somebody is watching this, they can maybe figure out what I'm trying to say. Um, so let's let's start here. So electromagnetic spectrum, just a reminder. Um, I mean, you know the whole spectrum, right? And this graphic gives how much of each wavelength makes it to the surface of the Earth. Okay, so visible light which is where we are. Uh, it all makes all makes it to the to the surface. Uh, UV is out in here. Some of it makes it, some of it does not. So um, if you want to do, um, and, and UV light is important because if you look at um, how it relates to the whole spectrum and how in stars in particular, um, the, the the temperature of the different stars steers what uh, what UV light spectrum it's going to be centered in. So um, so that then steers where you need where you need to be looking for the different types of stars. So in our case, um, uh, UV is where um, they wanted to be able to look because they can't see it on the Earth. Um, and so with that, the only way to do it is to either go above the Earth's atmosphere in space or go somewhere else and do it. So that's kind of how this came about and why it ended up like that. So let's just talk about a little bit of background. Um, so UV astronomy, if you go back in the 60s, I mean, trying to do this is, was not uh, un unknown. They used sounding rockets um, for many years to try and get above high enough in the atmosphere. Uh, they would only get like five minutes of, of readings um, and before the rocket came back down because it's just in a in a ballistic arc. Um, so it's 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 just, it's the initial data that they had, but it wasn't uh, very long. They had these orbiting astronomical observatories that were planned. <laughs> Um, and they're pretty, pretty massive uh, satellites. The, the first one, it failed after launch. So they had nothing. Uh, but they got the second one up in 1968. Um, it operated for four years. It was in a pretty high orbit, 480 miles. Um, and it had this, what they called the UV telescope. Um, but it, um, it lost its capability after about a year. And as far as this, the limiting magnitude was about 10 for the photometers. So it kind of gives you a sense of how sensitive these were. So that's kind of where the landscape was. Um, so when Apollo came and they were now going to the moon, the scientists lobbied to get a camera on, uh, on one of the missions. And that became uh, on, onto Apollo 16. Now they also did fly UV cameras on the service module. Uh, and those actually took photographs from the service module, but those cameras were not as as um, intense as this one. 
Um, you can see the principal investigators here, uh, Carruthers and Page, you'll see their name linked to this camera um, pretty, pretty often. Uh, this became known as Experiment S201 FAR UV Camera Spectrograph. Um, and the reason that's important is that same experiment number got carried forward to other missions. So it seemed like when they came up with experiment numbers, uh, they tried to match those across different missions. Uh, you can see they had a patent for their imager. Um, it, it flew on, uh, they had this other UV spectrometer on the Apollo 17 service module. And then the backup camera for Apollo 16 actually flew on Skylab. So, um, so that's the tie. And you can see the photo of them, these guys here, and that's the Apollo 16 mission patch. Yeah. That image converter for short wavelengths, what is that? Image converter. See, they got the patent for it. Does that convert UV to, to visible light? Or what is it? Yes, it, it was a patent that it, it, I'll show you in the next page on the camera oh, okay. makeup. Okay. Yeah, on, on kind of what they were after. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so that, that's kind of the background and how that and why that camera ended up on Apollo 16. So here's a picture. We're going to talk about this. You don't have to read all the words. Let's just go around the camera and we'll talk about it. So this is this is uh, some of what they developed. And it's basically turning UV light into an electronic image that then they could um, uh, save the image on film and emulsified film. Okay. And so that was really the, the heart of it. Um, so the incoming light came in here. This is just a Schmidt camera, basically. Uh, light came in here. You can see it was a three inch. Um, the parabolic mirror in the back, and then it focused it onto uh, this potassium bromide photocathode. It had corrector plates on it on the front that they automatically could switch. And the reason is, is these would then shift the, the wavelength. These would then shift the wavelength of light that, that the, um, uh, the photocathode would detect. Um, and the interesting thing about this is then they had these large magnets around it. And that's what focused the beam from from the, this image here onto the photographic film here. And that's that's the heart of how the camera took those images and put it on film. Because the film came back to the earth to be processed. Um, so if you wanna if you wanna really learn about this camera, you can go and look at all those, all the stuff about it. And I think this this started um, technology that then has advanced for much further than this, of course. Um, the primary mirror, it has a one, what, 1 1.3 inch hole in it. So that's the back of it where the image comes through. Um, so about, what is that? About a quarter of the quarter of the mirror is taken up by that center hole, something like that. Anyway, but this is a rough thing of how the camera works. Okay. It's, it's basically trying to get that image into an, uh, something that will push it across to the film as, as electrons. And then this magnet is what's focusing it into that. Okay? Uh, it was automatic. So once, the, once they set it, and you'll see this in a minute, it would automatically take exposures uh, on a time schedule that they, that they had set. Um, and then also it would also switch these, um, switch these corrector plates uh, per their schedule as well. Okay. Um, it also could do spectroscopy. Um, I don't, I don't have a visual image of how it actually worked, but it would flip this camera 90 degrees, and by doing that, it could then f uh, do a spectrograph of a thin slice of what it was viewing. Um, and you'll see some of that data in a minute. But that's uh, that's the basic uh, setup for the camera. As far as the wavelengths. Uh, this is the UV spectrum, UV A, B, and C, and it was it was out here in the UV C range uh, because UV A and B is what does come down to Earth, and UV C uh, does not. So that's the that's the wavelength they were they were uh, working in. Okay, 
And then uh, as we had talked about the stars, they were wanting to see basically the spectral class stars, OBAs, um, with, uh, with their temperatures in the 10 to 50,000 degree Kelvin range. So that, those are the stars that really emit that light in that uh, wavelength range. Okay. All right, let's move on. So here's the camera and, tra and training the astronauts. You can, um, you can see the camera here. This is what it looked like. Uh, it was on a tripod, um, had an Altaz um, um, mount with it. Um, they trained the astronauts full up in suits because they had to make sure that they could move this camera and turn the knobs and all that stuff that they needed to do. Um, they, uh, you know, on the, on the moon, the astronauts could see, they couldn't see any stars in the sky through their visors. There's too much, the moon's too bright. Uh, so they couldn't see stars. The only thing they could see was the earth. So this camera was fully done just by um, the Altaz settings that they, that they put uh, based on what the scientists wanted to see. Uh, the, the exception was they did look at the earth and they had a little viewfinder that the, he could actually make sure he was pointing at the earth. But this thing had a 20 degree field of view, so pretty big. So they could be off a little bit and still get the area they were looking for. Um, uh, Commander John Young, many of y'all may know that name. He was, he was the one who operated this camera uh, on the moon. And they had a whole series of, uh, of their um, uh, training, uh, uh, their procedures and stuff like that to do that. And you can see the whole gang here with um, Carruthers here as the main guy doing the, the telescope stuff. So that's 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 what it looked like. That's how it that's how they got it. It's not small. <laughs> this is this is not a small instrument. So um, let's see how we got it there. Um, we can start here. The, um, the the camera was stored in the descent stage of the lunar module. Uh, many of y'all are familiar with the lunar module, hopefully. Um, it's got these quadrants around it. Um, the camera was in this quadrant here. And just for uh, relative, the lunar rover was in this quadrant here, and the ladder is right here. So when you look at this photo, the quadrant that the camera was in is here. You can see it, the, the, the little flap is open. Uh, the, the ladder's on the other side. <coughs> and the lunar rover, which is already deployed, was on the back side of the lunar module. So that's, that's where they had this camera stored. It took up a good bit of space because it wasn't small. Um, and then just for when, when landing, something maybe to appreciate is uh, because this, this camera needed to be in the shade. So they had to, they used this camera next to the lunar module in the shade uh, because the sun, they didn't want the sun on the camera. It would actually destroy the film. So um, when this Apollo 16 landed, this is the, where the where the sun was on on the moon you can see it's a pretty it's just becoming into lunar day so the sun angles pretty 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 much toward the horizon uh, when they left from this mission you can see apollo 16 here the sun was pretty high in the sky so they had to plan this pretty carefully on doing all these images to make sure that they could get what they needed in the time frame where the sun was going to be as well. Does that make sense? Um, so one thing they did find is that the landing got delayed a few hours. Before they landed, they had some issues in, in lunar orbit. So it delayed it at some hours. So all the targets that they had planned and where they were going to be, they basically had to change all those on the fly. <coughs> because they ended up landing late, so the sun angles were wrong. Um, and what they found is they had to pick up and move that camera every day 
to keep it in the shade. So it, it became it became uh, something that they actually actually had to manage quite a bit. But that's that's a little bit of, of, of kind of how they got it there and, and how it was deployed. Um, so Mark, is yeah. this in the right direction by pointing part of the sun? Is that what it said there? Say that again? In your slide there, it looked like they cited the whole thing by citing the sun. That's how they figure out how where to point it. No, they, they they cited it by point by citing it down sun. So he down sun. He, he pointed it so he knew the sun was behind him. And that gave him the direction because okay. they knew where the sun angle was, right. and that gave him a rough idea of what the um, what, okay. what the azimuth was. And so, when you look at their sighting locations, when they say like 100 degrees, that's not 100 degrees north; that's 100 degrees from west, because okay. so zero was west right. or close to west. Okay. It's it's kind of it's kind of. <laughs> Um, just a little bit more on deployment. Um, in this photo here, you can see here's the lunar module. This is from the LRO uh, observatory uh, around the moon right now. Um, and you can see the camera is located right here. Okay, right, right, next, to, uh, right next to the lunar module. Um, it, it, in this, in, you can look in some photos here. Um, like this one, this is, I don't know, some of y'all, this is kind of a famous photo of John Young doing his jumping salute, uh, but you can see the camera down here behind him, okay? Um, and just something else maybe to appreciate is when they deployed this, uh, this was very early in the mission. Um, and so here's some EVA times on the first mission. Uh, 14 minutes after they got out of the limb, they deployed the lunar rover. Um, and then he went to retrieve this UV camera 35, 38 minutes after getting on the moon. So one of the very first things they did was to get this camera out. And they had it doing its first imaging uh, within the first hour. So you can see he spent about 20 minutes getting it set up initially. So this was an investment of time for these astronauts on the moon. Um, maybe something else to appreciate. This, this kind of gives a view of where the targets were. So this is where the shadow or where the limb was blocking, where they couldn't see. Now, one thing that's goofy about this picture, it took me forever to figure this out. North is not up, north is down. So, um, uh, when you look at it, almost all these uh, almost all these target areas are in the southern part of the galactic plane, um, and they're mostly uh, east. So um, you you can kind of see that. Something else to appreciate, and this is looking at the angle of the sun and how it changed. You can see the camera deployed here after the first EVA, and you can see how much how long the shadows are on the lunar module. And then this is the camera on the third one. And you can, you can tell that that shadow is notably less. Um, it just kind of goes to how they had to move the camera every time. So let's just talk about some of the things that they learned. Um, so this was the first time to actually be away from the earth pretty far and have a UV camera point at the earth. Um, so what, what looks like was pretty important first time learnings um, is they did point it at the earth. This image is super processed. There are other images, but basically the earth is in the very center of this image. And this is the uh, hydrogen halo around the earth. So they, this, they call it the geo corona. Um, and they, they basically learned that that geo corona is about 10 earth radii uh, bigger than the earth. Okay, I've seen some more recent numbers where they talk about it being maybe 15 times, but it gives, it, you can kind of, you, you know, you, they learn now that there was a very large, uh, large area. They also found, um, pointing it at the earth, they found these two bands, um, basically on the dark side of the earth, um, that they call tropical air glow auroral belts, uh, which they had not recognized before. So those, those are there. 
And then for the spectrometer, they actually took an image of the Earth. And apparently this was the first time that they looked at the uh, helium line, the oxygen line, and uh, the hydrogen line at 102. So they could actually see those in the spectra. But this is what one of their spectra uh, images would look like. But anyway, you can kind of get us, you can see here what it looks like looking at the Earth through that camera. So let's move up. Yeah? Uh, see the uh, tropical band? Or mm -hmm. what, are, what is the lower one? Is that the north or south? <coughs> are you talking about this one here, that right there? That one? It's visible all right here? Yeah, I don't know that. Let's keep moving on. So these are celestial items. Uh, so they looked at the Earth, but they mostly looked at the at the sky. Um, they took 178 photographs during this mission. Um, 85 of them were images, 68 were spectra, 25 were the were combined exposures. However, that worked. But here you can see here this is what one of them looked like. And when they processed them, they could then process them and and basically work them into these type of, um, um, of images and contours and see how, and see how that worked. Um, here's a couple of another, uh, other images of Cygnus and Aquarius. And, you know, when I first looked at these, I started studying this to find out, well, well, where's Cygnus at? And it took me forever to try and figure out where Cygnus was until it struck me that I can't see Cygnus in this because this is UV light. And, <laughs> And, and that's not what this image is. And this image is not showing Cygnus and what we can see. You can't, you can't find the constellations in these images. Uh, maybe you can, but I, I could not. Um, and then getting back to that thing about the sky and where they were shooting, you can see here's the galactic center. And then all these circles are the uh, image areas where they were shooting. Okay, And you can see they're all in the southern part of the galactic, but they took, they did take some uh, along the galactic equator. Okay. Um, they did 10 star fields and they, they actually did, had more than 10,000 objects in all of them. Let's keep going. So there's a lot of stuff on this page. I just wanted to show you some of the analysis they did. Um, so these, this is, let me orient you a bit. These two uh, vertical rows, uh, ver vertical columns here are um, star fields in the high galactic latitude. So that's this one and this one, which is Aquarius and Grus. And then these are in the low galactic at, uh, altitude. So right here along the equator, okay? And the difference is, as you can see, the star counts. Uh, 51 objects in this one, 43, 730 here, and 1,000 here. So significantly more stars along the galactic equator. And when you think about it, it's what you would expect. Um, when they did the, the uh, when they integrate the UV light in each of these images, um, what they found is along the higher latitude stuff, the, 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 the UV light is concentrated in some of the larger, more powerful UV um, objects. Whereas when you go to along the equator, it's a more gradual um, build as far as the as far as how it um, integrates into the UV curve. Anyway, that's just some of the stuff that they did. Okay. And then lastly, this is the last piece. Um, just kind of summarize, this is the first and, and it's the only astronomical telescope that's sitting on the moon. And it's still there. Um, it, um, when you look at it, this, these images, this is the one at Space Center Houston. Space Center Houston has the, one of the backup cameras. It's uh, serial number two. When you look on the lunar landscape at Space Center Houston, it's this camera off to the right. It's kind of out there by, by itself. If you go to the um, National Air and Space Museum, they have one sitting in front of the uh, lunar module. 
Um, and this one is serial number four. Um, and the, the film pack on it is the actual film pack they brought back from the moon. Um, so that's, um, that's how that, that's what that one is. And then there's a third camera, which we're not sure which serial number that is. Um, but it's, this is at the National <laughs> Research Labs, uh, National um, Naval Research Labs. Um, and so that's where that one is. Um, but that's where you can see these cameras if you want to take a look. And there's a lot of information online if you want to go to the NASA website and uh, check it out. So that's all I got. Good job. Any questions? Cool. Yeah, you must have done a good job. <laughs> all right, thank you, Mark. Okay, as you can see, we have lots of variety in our meetings. That was good. Oh, backup stuff. He didn't do the backup. You want to come back and do the backup stuff? Yeah. All right. Okay, Ron, you want to tell us about the DVD library? Magazine are about 45 minutes long. Of course, the great courses are, in fact, great courses. They're you know, 10 to 15 lectures long. And if you don't have a DVD player anymore, we will loan you one plug, a USB plug for your computer. Oh, my goodness. No more excuses. <laughs> there you go. So we're going to have a break here in a minute. You guys can go and get yourself a DVD and a DVD player if you need it from Ron. So after the meeting, the meeting after the meeting, we're going to go up to the Mod Pizza that's at Clear Lake City Boulevard in El Dorado, right in front of the HEB. Get together there and talk about astronomy and a variety of other topics. You're all welcome to come. And uh, we will take a 10-minute break, and then we'll get back and do the second half of our meeting.
Okay, I got this all out. Oh, you know why I should get those? Okay, we are going to get started. Yes, sir, Rini, we are going to get started. <laughs> I can see you guys don't believe me that we're going to get started. Yeah. Okay. We're going to get started. That's you. We're going to get started. John. John. Yeah. Am I going to have to cowbell him? Yeah, he, he doesn't know I'm here. Uh, yeah, David and Connie got me this cowbell. This is for you, John. Come on, we're trying to start the meeting. Come on. All right, radio astronomy, sun crossing. I know you guys thought you're going to get away with a meeting with no radio astronomy, but no. This is going to be a quick one. <laughs> All right, so another thing you can do with radio astronomy is you can actually get the sun when the sun goes by. Which, and the point of this is that this shows that the sun doesn't only radiate light and heat, but also radiates uh, radio frequencies also. So there it is. There's the sun. You see over there in the right-hand side, you see the sun go by. You see this nice little peak. This is at 1409 megahertz. And uh, so the sun is also a radio source because of all those magnetic things going on in the sun. It's putting out all kinds of cool radio radiation. There, just one more time. Another thing you can do with radio astronomy, you can do sun crossings, measure the sun. Okay. You guys believe it? Of course. Is that the correspond to 10.7 centimeters wavelength. Correspond to what? 10.7 centimeters. That's something the Canadians have been measuring. No, it's it's near 20 centimeters. It's around 21 centimeters. Yeah, they measure 10.7. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. That's a good. Maybe we could try that sometime. No, the only reason I did this is because it's it's within the range of my low noise amplifier, and it's not right at hydrogen. It's just another <laughs> one around there, and it's somewhere where there's there's. I know it doesn't look like it, but there's less man made noise around there. That's the only reason I picked it. There's nothing else particular about it. We always thought, what's the ten point seven put into that model? We were four trans geeks, so we thought that was the format state. Oh, okay, <laughs> cool. All righty. You guys done looking at that? All right. Another thing you can do with radio astronomy. Look at the sun. All right. Next one is Phil Stewart. Phil is not here because we actually had three people who have card trouble tonight, believe it or not. So Phil had card trouble also. He's not here, but he's got a really cool presentation. You guys can look at this presentation. He'll probably do it next month. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah. So we were doing a lot of stuff about the sun tonight, but... You know, if your car breaks down, your car breaks down, right? Yeah, pretty cool. That's Phil. He's got all kinds of cool stuff. Okay, so next we have Jerry, who has the, the question we all want to know about. What about Steve? That's what we all really want to know, right? What about Steve? Jerry's going to tell us all about it. All right, so. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, just return the advance and backspace to go back. Return. Okay. Ah, got it. It works. Okay, good. Well, this uh, um, investigation of mine, sort of, uh, was inspired by a Science News article from February, as you see the cover of it there. Uh, called Enigma in the Sky, 
and I had to come up with a title. So it kind of reminded me of this old uh, Bill Murray, Richard Dreyfus movie, What About Bob? So I came up with What About Steve? <laughs> and what is Steve? Um, why did I get that name? Is another question that I wanted to look at. And um, what uh, is the mechanism for it? The phenomenon is shown on the cover there. It's this purple uh, stream that you see there. And then you can see these little uh, green, um, they call them picket fence uh, discharges that uh, often associated with it. So uh, this is considered to be an aurora-like glow. Uh, and you can see there that the article says it perplexes science scientists. It certainly perplexed me. Uh, and the physics is indeed very complex. Uh, there's a series of articles in Science News by this same author, uh, Maria Timming. Uh, this is the latest one. And if it works, I will attempt to show you this video. It's not going to work? Okay. Well, it, all it is really is the streaming part of this purple glow. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't know you wanted to do that. That's okay. Sorry. It's not, it's not important. Uh, there's a lot of studies recently been published, and they're based on satellite data from the two dates you see there. Um, so what is it? It's a, it's a purple uh, band of light that goes from east to west, and it arises from this westward flowing stream of plasma, uh, which is at about 200 kilometers altitude. Now, I was not aware of this. It's quite interesting. This is a plasma stream that is much more uh, tropical than the uh, kind of uh, mechanisms that create auroras. It, basically, a, a stream of charged particles uh, flows about five kilometers per second, and it heats up atmospheric molecules through friction and causes them to emit this purple light. Now, why is it purple? Um, it's purple, considered to be purple because it basically uh, breaks up nitrogen molecules, which then combine with oxygen to form nitric oxide. And the glow from nitric oxide has this purple um, emission. Um, also, uh, some studies have shown that the duration of this excited nitrogen oxide is about an hour, which is about the same as this particular phenomenon. Um, one of the interesting things about it is this, this uh, plasma stream and the phenomenon occur much closer to the equator than auroras do. So it's a different mechanism than, than auroras. Uh, you see the name Nishimura there. He's one of the prominent investigators of this uh, uh, phenomenon who's been publishing recently. So, Jerry, is this yes. Did you want to see from space? No, no, you see it from the ground. <laughs> Yeah. Now, can you see it from space? I don't know. I was kind of intrigued by those bands that Mark just showed because one of them looked like it was more equatorial yeah. than the auroras. <laughs> Interesting. So when you say much closer to the equator than the auroras, that's a huge range there. Yeah, it's a huge range. Like over the U.S. latitude? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's not totally tropical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, most electrons flow north south because the magnetic field that's right <laughs> south pole, but this is going across the magnetic field. That's that's so right. One of those special plasma flows. It's a plasma flow, right? Okay. And presumably not just electrons, but other charged uh, uh, particles, yeah, uh, ions and uh, molecules. Uh, it's not clear exactly what the composition is, and I think that's all of this is sort of under active investigation. So this is uh, what it looks like from the ground. And this includes this picket fence phenomenon, which doesn't always occur with it, but the picket fence phenomenon is thought to be similar to an aurora in that it is uh, electrons uh, precipitating down through the atmosphere and causing oxygen to glow. So the green glow is oxygen, purple glow presumably is nitric oxide. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, so the question there, why does it accompany Steve, is a question of investigation. And I don't think there's an answer to that at this moment. It looks like the green stripes follow the north-south magnetic field line. That's right. <coughs> it's, it yeah. seems that way, yeah. I'm not sure, I'm not sure of exactly the orientation, but, but they are perpendicular yeah. to, the, to the purple. <laughs> right. 
Okay, so there are some other concepts that kind of go along with this. One is one called SAID, which is sub-auroral ion drifts. These are narrow, rapid westward flows of extremely hot plasma, and this is sort of part of this plasma, westward plasma flow. Um, and this is through at the level of the ionosphere. And so, you know, I look up the layers of the atmosphere, and the ionosphere is not there. Uh, it's not considered to be one of the technical layers. So the, what is the ionosphere? It starts in a mesosphere and then includes the thermosphere. So it's it's actually the part of the atmosphere where there is ionization, and it's not a formal layer anymore anyway. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting is that this usually occurs between dusk and midnight and very occasionally after midnight, and that's when this phenomenon also occurs. Uh, another related thing are these stable auroral red arcs, or SAR. These are structures you can see in the sky that are linked to uh, the SAID events, these ion drifts. And Steve, which uh, has become an acronym for strong thermal emission velocity enhancement, which is a bit of gobbledygook, is linked to these two things. Okay, and I'll talk about how this, this acronym came about in just a minute. <laughs> okay, so to compare with aurora, the, the um, uh, aurora phenomenon, again, I emphasize, is not fully understood, certainly not by me, but also apparently not by the people who study it. Um, and you all probably know that it's uh, ionization, excitation of gas molecules in the atmosphere by electrons precipitating down along the magnetic lines of force. And because they go closer to the Earth at the poles, that's why that phenomenon tends to occur near the poles. So one of the things that I wasn't really totally aware of is that the uh, electrons get accelerated during their last descent into the ionosphere and um, along the magnetic lines. And the fields that accelerate them are very complex and are related to the magnetosphere of the <laughs> Earth and also its interaction with the sun's magnetic field. These particles get trapped. They come from solar wind. They get trapped in the magnetosphere and uh, they are they leak out on the, the dark side mostly of, of the Earth. Uh, partly due to instabilities, and these instabilities are called magnetic substorms, uh, as opposed to the geomagnetic storms that are due to solar activity and last a long time and can interfere with communications and stuff. But these substorms only last hours, and so they kind of correlate with uh, aurora uh, activity. Um, so I think I said most of that. Um, oh, let me go back just a second. Go back was backspace. Backspace. Nope, doesn't work. Didn't work. <laughs> That's okay. Um, this next slide is just to give you an idea of the structure of the magnetosphere, and you can see the solar wind coming in from the left uh, there. Uh, you can get an idea here of the distances. Uh, you can see the the magnetic field facing the sun gets compressed. And you can see the distance here of 65,000 kilometers. But before that, there basically is a place where the uh, particles in the solar wind are uh, <coughs> slowed down. And it is, creates really kind of a shock wave. And that's called the bow shock for the, for the uh, solar wind. Uh, and then you can see how the particles are deflected. A lot of them are deflected around the magnetosphere. But some of them get trapped. And those are the ones that can then leak out and form uh, auroras. Uh, a lot of particles uh, can get into this plasma sheet, uh, but there's a but there's a space there and also uh, up here where there aren't very many particles. So it's a very complex system. And I also want to emphasize that uh, the magnetic field of the Earth rotates with the planet. So you basically have something that is a little bit like a dynamo that can create some of these electrical fields that do things like accelerate electrons and, and perhaps create this, this plasma flow as well. Okay, enter. Okay, and I also wanted to emphasize the magnetic field of the sun. Uh, this artist's uh, uh, graph basically uh, shows 
the way that the uh, solar wind, the plasma coming from the sun, gets altered by this rotating magnetic field. So, so it is a lot more complex than what you saw in the previous image, where it just looks like it's coming directly uh, from the from the sun in a relatively uh, uniform fashion. So it's not that uniform. Okay, so how did Steve get its name? Well, the story goes that it was named by a photographer who was in a Facebook group of Alberta Aurora Chasers. And he was familiar with this movie from 2006. It's an animated movie called Over the Hedge where there's a bunch of forest critters that wake up one day and find that their forest is blocked from a newly developed subdivision by this giant hedge. So they look at it, they don't know what it is. Um, they're all talking about it. And the squirrel pops up and says, let's call it Steve. <laughs> so, you know, now the scientists get hold of it and that's not good enough for them. They have to come up with an acronym. So <laughs> they come up with a strong thermal emission velocity enhancement uh, terminology. And now that is what you call a backronym. <laughs> because it was invented after the name. <laughs> and these are the re some of the resources that I've, I found. Uh, I'll just say that uh, the physics behind these phenomena is very complex. And I tried to look into that a little bit and was somewhat discouraged at, uh, at trying to understand it all. But it is something that there are a lot of people investigating. And if you want to know more about it, uh, one good place to start is Wikipedia. They have some good articles and a lot of references. So thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I understand you said you wanted to observe this or photograph it. You said between dusk and midnight, is there certain times of year that's more... That, that is not clear. It's, it's, it's a much rarer phenomenon than Aurora. Okay. So the, I think the... The guidance is you have to be in the right place at the right time. Okay, are there are certain uh, latitudes that are best. I think the middle latitudes are the general. So true range. Mid, mid yeah. latitudes. Yeah. Interesting. But it's rare. Okay, so it doesn't always happen, it just happens yeah. sometimes. It's always east to west. It's purple. It's purple. <laughs> sometimes with a green picket fence. Oh, the one thing I didn't I meant to mention on that slide that I skipped over pretty quickly was the uh, colors and uh, red and green from auroras are oxygen, uh, different ionization states of oxygen, excitation states, and the blue, which is a lot less common, is from nitrogen. Right. And then we talked about nitric oxide. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs> Oh my goodness, we're going to get done early. You guys probably thought you'd never see the day. Oh, no, we're not. David, Star Party News. Come on, David. Let's see if David's going to stretch this out for 20 minutes and keep us on schedule. Why don't you try to be okay with 15 minutes? <laughs> yeah. Why are we not applauding for David? Come on. <laughs> Hello again. All right. April Star Party News. This actually will be quick because guess what? Nothing happened. Um, <laughs> March 15th, Friday, Hack Winery. This was actually a total rain out. Um, we're dealing with one of the big wigs of Hack, which is really, really good. Uh, I believe he's one of the co owners. And um, he actually called me up and said, weather's not looking too good. Yeah, I know. It's kind of looking like it's going to suck epically. Um, you want to call it? I said, let's give it one more day. First thing, email next morning, we're calling it. I didn't even have a chance to. I said, okay. And But yeah, by the, I always feel vindicated that when we call off something, it's pouring rain when the event actually occurs, then I feel vindicated. Um, so there you go. All right. April 4th, 8th club gathering at Fort McKevin. I understand you two guys went and it was and Brandon and I can I got a little feedback from Ken 
the event was there, but it was you also kind of had some sucky weather too, as I understand it, right? Two pretty good nights. Two pretty good nights. Okay. Okay. Tenfeld attendance was down because the, everybody was scattering like cattle for the eclipse. Um, we were on ne negotiations with someone from Armand Bay and Nature Center uh, for a star party after internal cons consultation and being really as tactfully nice as I possibly can. We had the usual elementary school thing. Oh, we'd like you to have a star party from, you know, like five to six. <laughs> Sunset's not until 7.30. We can't see anything unless, you know, I try to make sure the moon's in play or a very, you know, bright planet like Jupiter's in play. I said, we'll get back to you. Um, and they decided to pot until, um, pot until the fall. So it just so happens that the next, <laughs> next four events here are all um, hack winery. April 19th, I've uh, asked Chris Randall if he can help head that one because I'm at a, I'm at a conference that day and will not be able to be there. Um, I, haven't I haven't checked out a 10-day forecast yet on it. Uh, September, another one, Okitex. Um, October 12th, International Observe the Moon Night. October 28th to 27th is tentative to the fort. And as through Sunday night, uh, they're being allowed to stay until Monday because then I think they can go from 28th to the 2nd to El Dorado. That's how we're trying to work that. So if you go to go to uh, Fort McCavitt, you can just sidestep another day and go to El Dorado. <clears throat> and that's pretty much it. That's what I figured you were going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I want to make sure everybody understands what David just said. Fort McCavitt in the fall is four nights, not three nights. Because everybody says we wish it was one more night. It's four nights in the fall, and you can go directly from there to the El Dorado Star Party if you want to. But four nights for Fort McCavitt in the fall. I'm going to go. So I hope some of you, the rest of you will go. I had to go all the way up to Austin to be approved just for that extra night. Yeah, but that's great because that's exactly what we want to do. You know, we want to be there for four nights. If we want to go to El Dorado, we just get in our car, drive down the road, and you go to El Dorado Star Party if you want to. So that's good, good, good. All right, so I've been told that I should do this first and then door prizes next. So I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what people tell me to do. And so now our next meeting is going to be May 10th here. And it's going to be the current state of gravitational wave research by Dr. Aaron Clevenson with uh, the Asperity Observatory. We all know Aaron, he's really a great speaker. So that's gonna be really good. And after we get done here, we're gonna go to Mod Pizza. I was told we should do this so the people who are online can drop off and not have to listen to our uh, door prizes. So next is door prizes. So everybody get your door prize ticket out and we will do some door prizes. <laughs> oh, did everybody get a door prize ticket? Anybody not get a door prize ticket? Okay. First one is ending in 813. All right, Paul. This guy's going to be one of our future speakers. You just watch. We're talking them into it. Okay, so what we have is we have a moon map. We have, if you're an astronomer, it's a uh, astronomer's journal. We also have STS-93 launch and landing pictures, I think. We also have these cool, these are like uh, pictures you put on your wall of different patterns. Look at that radio telescope. That's cool. Some kind of balance thing. Or, I'm driving me crazy. Honest. Okay, an observatory. We also have, let me see if I can find anything else. He doesn't look too thrilled about any of these. Mm -hmm. A Celestron red flashlight. You gonna take the moon map? All right, David makes his moon map. So. <coughs> That's a great one. All right, you'll be watching him. He's going to be one of our future speakers. He actually, I think he used to work down in Chile, right? Right now. What? Only there. Yeah. Okay, but that's that's pretty cool. So, all right, we are going to have next one is eight two zero. Come on, Carrie, get on down here. Okay, we actually still have more moon maps. Okay, we have a red, a Celestron red flashlight. Oh, uh, I might need one of those. Oh, you want one of those? Sure. All right, very good. All right. One more. We do one more. I know you guys, you guys are wishing it was your number. <laughs> okay, 838. Oh, one off. 
Brandon, come on. <laughs> we got Pat Reed. Look at that. Pretty cool. Pat and Reed. Tell us about those. Oh, the a dome. Uh, some kind of planet thing pattern. We have a moon map. We have STS 93 crew pictures. Oh, we have we'll the radio. Uh, radio oh, my goodness. Is that the one you want? <laughs> All right, very good. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. See you next month, right here, same place. And we're going to have a great time. And see you at Mod Pizza. All right. Yeah. I get my clipboard. Oh, let's see. Got my flash drive down the line.